So my name is Michelle. Um, I do think some of you know me, um, whether you've seen videos or you've been here to the center um, to speak with me. There are other dietitians here, but this has been kind of my baby for a while. And I do really feel like I know this particular condition, whether it's bronchiectasis or NTM. And so it's helpful to talk to someone who knows it because then they can spot where you are and what you need and maybe give you some advice from the perspective of having seen a very broad spectrum of people who deal with this. So let me get started. I would like to go over just kind of justifying the importance of nutrition if it's not already obvious. I'd like to talk about some diet trends that always end up at my doorstep. If, even if you have bronchiectasis or NTM, everyone's eating low carb, it seems like as an example, um, and we'll talk about whether or not they are appropriate for you. And then I'd like to give you the nutrition guidelines as I see them or through my own clinical judgment, as well as what I've been able to dig up in the literature and what I've seen work in real practice. So we'll talk about your needs in terms of your calorie needs, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then I do want to talk a little bit about if you really need a little bit of extra help, what are some of the more um, extreme measures or advanced measures that we might recommend to help you be healthy? And those include appetite stimulants and tube feeding, which can be a difficult conversation, so we'll touch on it briefly. And then we'll look at dietary supplements because I see a lot of those. And a lot of times people are, are on more dietary supplements than they are on medications. Um, and there's pros and cons, um, but I do like to put out a little caution about that. And if you've seen this talk last year, it, this is the same slide deck. I hope though that it's a good reminder as it was for me when Dr. King spoke. It's always good to hear him say similar things because I catch things. And I will also just try and hopefully add some things that hopefully will cut through some of the confusion and maybe give you some clarity because I know you all have had a lot of information today. It's a lot of information even for me. So I'm gonna try and keep this as uh, digestible, <laughs> easy to digest as possible, <laughs> pun intended, I guess. Okay, so starting with why nutrition is important, um, the main thing I want you to know is that it is directly related to how strong your immune system is. Um, what does this mean? Well, the immune, your immune system is constantly working to protect you from infection. It is what is sensing that you have mycobacterial infection or another bug potentially. It's what is your own body's defense system. So the antibiotics can only do so much. Your own immune system has to step up and do the job. The, and your immune system really relies on everything you put in your mouth. So I think I say this repeatedly, but food is like your medicine. It is like a drug in the sense that it's a therapy. And how well your immune function is dependent on the quality of what you put in your mouth. And um, the antibiotics are helpful, don't get me wrong, um, super helpful, but sometimes people forget that, well, I'm on antibiotics, so I kind of have a free pass maybe to do or what I want or not with what I want to with my diet, but that's not necessarily the best logic to apply, especially with a chronic disease like NTM. So we know <clears throat> that malnutrition, meaning if you don't eat enough calories or if you don't eat enough protein, or if you have deficiencies in one or more essential minerals and vitamins, which the, the deficiencies in vitamins and minerals is not super common, truly in this country, with the exception of maybe things like people like yourselves who have really high nutrient needs and maybe your vitamin D is a little bit low or deficient. But in general, what I see more of is people who aren't able to keep up with their calorie and protein needs. And so they're underweight and they are somewhat malnourished. And we know that malnutrition and deficiencies can impair your immunity. In the third world where people are malnourished, uh, malnutrition is the primary cause of immunodeficiency. So there's a link, they're inextricably linked. You can't uh, separate them. Um, and I'm going to go through what Linus Pauling shows online. So Linus Pauling has a really nice overview of the immune system. I'm going to give you the bullet points so that I don't spend too much time here, but 
Um, it is helpful to make to understand your immunity so I can help you appreciate that what you eat is what is creating your immune system. Your immune system really consists of a bunch of cells that come from the bone marrow and then they're distributed throughout the body. Um, Dr. Lomach mentioned neutrophils and Dr. Daly just mentioned macrophages. So different types of immune cells have different functions. Immune cells are made with fat for the cell wall. They're made with protein for every structure that goes into the cells. They, they are fueled by carbohydrate. And then of course there's vitamins and minerals that also need to, to play their own part. But these uh, are made constitutively, you are what you eat. That's a truth. So there are three levels of defense in your body. There's our barriers, so our skin, our stomach acid, our microbiota. And then your, if something penetrates your barriers like NTM, you will have, your immune system will sense that there is something disease causing in your system and it will start a series of reactions. It kind of like calls 911 and says, whoa, we have an invader. We have something going on. We need to um, get some help. <laughs> And so the innate immune system is what kicks in right away. And then your adaptive immunity kicks in over time. It kind of customizes uh, its response to the, the pathogen. The, there are three key features of your immune system. Inflammation is the first. Inflammation starts with the immune system. When the immune system sees something it doesn't like, it sends out inflammatory signals cytokines, if, you, if you're familiar with this, and those signals recruit other helpers. Um, inflammation is good because it starts a domino reaction to bring in other helpers for the immune system, um, but there's a downside to it, which is that it can kind of marshal all of your resources, and in the more advanced stages, it can really consume you. So I'll talk more about that. But I want you to appreciate that your immune system recognizes the NTM, it triggers inflammation. And I'll, the last thing I'll point out on here is that Linus Pauling points out that the omega-3 fats, EPA and DHA, are helpful in tamping down inflammation a little bit because as I believe Dr. Lomach mentioned, if you have too much, it can damage too much. So you wanna have a controlled inflammatory response. And the omega-3 fats, good fats, are helpful for that as are other things, but they happen to point out the two omega-3 fats. Then another big feature is that you'll have this oxidative burst. You'll have a reactive oxygen species, probably not unlike nitric oxide, <laughs> that go and kill the invaders. And um, that's good because we're trying to take care of the pathogen. There are important nutrients involved, vitamin C, vitamin E, iron, zinc, copper, selenium. So these are all micronutrients, but you'll see that all of these nutrients are being recruited intensely for your immune system. Additionally, and this is a very important piece too, you'll have then a proliferative response. So the immune system tr um, is triggered, inflammation happens, and then we have a big like domino effect. And we've got a lot of things happening from a, a lot of different helpers. And what happens is you have your immune system making more immune cells. It says we need more help. And so you have this ramping up. And if you don't have the nutrients on board, if you don't have your calories, if you don't have your carbs, if you don't have your protein, if you don't have your fat, if you don't have all the nutrients you need, there's going to be a weak link and you will have more susceptibility, less resistance. Okay, so bottom line, as I mentioned, nutrition and your immunity and your ability to fight this infection are inextricably linked. The other reason why good nutrition is really important is that it combats wasting. So I know this sounds negative, but I'd like to just kind of call it as it is. So NTM is a consumptive condition. It can consume you. Why? Because inflammation decides to marshal all of your body's resources to fighting the infection. And so it leaves a little bit less for the rest of you. So your energy expenditure goes up. That means you burn more calories physically because this whole thing is a 
it's a battle <laughs> that's happening in you, in you every day. And when your immune cells turn over, they need to regenerate. So you're burning more calories. I would estimate approximately 30% more than you would be if you did not have NTM. What we see is a breakdown of lean body mass. That's your muscle mass, as well as other parts of you. And this is what I actually get really concerned about because when you start losing lean body mass, you become weak, you don't have balance. Um, you just don't have the oomph to fight the infection. So um, this can happen very rapidly if you have a very acute infection, particularly if it's severe, like if you're in the hospital, particularly if you're in intensive care unit, which that would be unusual. But the more severe the inflammation, the more quickly this process happens. And then we also see that you can excrete more protein. You can physically be losing nutrients on a daily basis. And appetite can go down just as part of the inflammation. It's not something that I want you to accept all of these things, including lack of appetite. I want you to see them as red flags and I want you to push back because if you don't do your part, it will take over. And not to be too dramatic, but um, if you don't eat, you may be eaten <laughs> physically. So we know that TB was called consumption. NTM is a similar process and you have to be on the alert and you have to fight back. You have to be very vigilant that you maintain your, your, your health and your weight. Uh, so I'm gonna put this up here too, cause I have another graph to show you. The point at which the severity or persistence of your inflammation causes a decrease in your lean body mass is this, at the point at which that causes you to be functionally impaired. Like you can't do as much as you used to do. Um, that is when we have disease-related malnutrition, which I would say is rampant with people who have bronchiectasis and NTM. This is the big issue. So this is a graph of a theoretical graph of disease-related malnutrition. And if you look at lean body mass um, going vertically and time in months going horizontally, what you'll see is that in the very, the solid red line is acute disease-related malnutrition. And what you'll see is that when you have severe inflammation, as some of you may have, in the course of just one month, you can lose 40% of your lean body mass. It happens like that. This is, think of people you know have been in the hospital and they were not well. They come out and they are not a skeleton, but they're a little bit less of what they were when they went in. Um, so that's severe. Now, the, the red dotted line is if you've had nutrition support during that time. You could have been tube fed, maybe they gave you TPN, maybe you were able to eat. Nutrition support mitigates the loss of lean body mass. That's, that's the importance of it. The blue line there is chronic disease-related malnutrition, which probably applies to people fighting NTM just on a chronic low-level basis. So I would say everyone with chronic infection is going to be at risk for loss of lean body mass. And if you don't have nutrition support, meaning you're not eating properly, or you don't have additional supplementation on board, or if needed, you don't have tube feeding, then you're at risk for getting really weak. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Because, and let me say this here because it's not in the slide deck. In the past year, what I've come to appreciate with your population and with this disease is that as weight goes down, people start to get stuck meaning they, they lose functionality and then they can't return back to their former baseline. So basically you start losing yourself, the things that you love to do, the energy you used to have, you start to decline. And what's hard for me is to see this happen to people and then ha and they're not able to get back to their former selves. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and when you talk to me, it's why I become so animated about it because I can see it happening. And then I'm trying to stop it <laughs> for your benefit. And let, one last word on this. I also meet people, like I met a lovely lady in the bathroom who said she had lost some weight and I don't know her story, but I do meet people who lose weight because you know, they had chemo or, and I understand that obviously we, we deal with other things in our life, but maybe they were caring for their mother and they forgot to eat. And they just thought, well, I, you know, my focus is here or it's with my kids or whatever, they're moving a house and they just, they lose 10 pounds. And then all of a sudden, like 
then their max flares, and then they lose another 10 pounds, and then they're stuck. So I think what I want to impress on people is really don't lose weight, if at all possible. I know you can't be perfect, but to the extent that you can, do not lose weight. Um, it's not serving you when you're trying to deal with a chronic infection. And then one, sorry, one last word. There are of course people who are like, but I wanna lose like five pounds cause I'm you know, 15 pounds heavier than I normally am. And to some degree there is, a, there is a time and a place for that, but you wanna be very mindful, meaning not when you're sick, when you're fighting an infection, you need every resource uh, on all hands on deck. Maybe when, you, when you're culture negative and you're in a remission period, maybe then we can talk about being a little more reasonable. But in general, I don't support weight loss ever. <laughs> it's really my big, um, one of my big talking points, if that's not clear. So finally, nutrition is important because low BMI is associated with poor outcomes. And Shannon and probably Chuck has talked a little bit about this. What we're talking about is a BMI of less than 18.5. That's our best guess. So what does that mean? Well, if you're an average female, 5'4", and you're 100 pounds, which I see every day in clinic, your BMI is 17. So, and I, I put this slide up here for your reference in case you want to calculate your own. So if you, and I gave it to uh, you units and uh, weight units in pounds and height units in inches because they're familiar. So this is the formula you can use to determine where you fall. Low BMI, is related to poor outcomes because we see more disease progression. That's not what we want. We see more uh, diseased lung se segments. Again, not what we want. We see higher mot mortality, not what we want. And we see sometimes we think we see poor response to antibiotic therapy. Shannon also, Dr. Casper also mentioned yesterday that low BMI was associated with um, uh, not sustaining culture conversion. So I think that's progression, but you know, there's, there's a uh, correlation between you not fighting the infection as well or ending up with more severe disease if you let your body weight go too low. Having said this, we don't know what comes first. We don't know if the disease made your body weight go low and that's why you might not be doing as well or if it started with the low BMI. There's some type of association. We're not entirely clear. We just know that there is some control. You have some control over your weight and what you eat. And we want to give you the strongest fighting chance to be as healthy as possible. So I put up uh, goal weights for the average female and male. Uh, for a woman, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, we want you over 110 pounds, again, to hit that BMI goal. Uh, for a man, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, on average, we want you over 130. And honestly, that seems too low to me just on site. But just so you know what where the calculated uh, goals lie. I did want to say a word about body image because, so, because women, unfortunately, um, particularly women, not to exclude men, but deal with this. There is a cultural bias in our society for thinness. And um, I would argue that that's not really serving you here, even though you might be rewarded for it. People might tell you you look good. I would try not to take that too much to heart. The more you have on you, um, the stronger you're going to be for the rest of your life. There's also a fear of getting fat in people, particularly people who might be prone to having some type of disordered eating pattern or mindset. And that's really challenging. I, um, I could... There's a lot to say on that. But what I'm going to tell you is that if you have NTM in your lower body weight, you will, I have yet to see one patient that's gotten fat. Nobody gets fat who tries to gain weight with NTM. It's that hard. Um, so you will probably not get fat. <laughs> and I would also have you maybe question whether or not like that, if you have that fear and it's a real barrier for you, you may need help. Um, and there should be no shame in that. And you should look for help or at least if not self-help, then maybe some other kind of therapy that might help you through that. A lot of women also have concern for gaining belly fat. I had uh, one patient say to me, well, can I gain enough muscle so that my BMI gets to a normal range? <laughs> and I get that. We all want to be strong. You know, we all at one point were a lot stronger and leaner, bigger at one point. Um, 
it is very unlikely that you can gain muscle at this stage so that you're, you gain enough weight to get to a normal BMI. That's a very big ask. Can you gain some? Sure. The way you gain muscle is by putting on some extra weight and it's gonna come on your, your, your waist first. And then over time, if you can be active, it's going to redistribute. It could take months. So you have to give it time and also be kind to yourself and look at some weight gain, not as weight gain, but as like weight reserves. That's your strength. Okay, so diet trends, are they right for you? This is everything I'm going to talk about. So feel free to try and read everything, but I'll go down. So a lot of people uh, think that they need to be drinking eight, eight ounces of water every day, either for general good health which is a myth, I'm going on record saying that, um, but also because they're on antibiotics. So it's like, a, you know, you want to drink a lot of water. So if you need to maintain a healthy weight or gain some weight, limit your plain water and get your hydration from calorie containing beverages. It could be cow's milk, could be a dairy-free alternative, in which case I'm going to recommend uh, Ripple, which is, or maybe I shouldn't recommend brands. I'm going to recommend high protein dairy-free alternatives. There are pea protein uh, milks. I just named one. Um, there is a soy, soy milk is high in protein as well. So you can do that. Um, you can use juice if you're not afraid of the sugar in juice. I'm okay with that. Um, and if you choose to use a nutritional supplement, know that the dense ones, the ones that are like 350 calories and eight ounces, those are 70% water. So they will hydrate you. So use your calorie beverages for hydration. Don't just drink a lot of plain water. You really need to substitute so that you can meet your calorie and your protein needs. Um, the second one is a lot of people, they say they've been eating healthy all their life and they eat lots of fruits and vegetables and they're very proud of this fact and that you should be. Um, however, you have to realize that those might be a barrier in terms of you getting enough uh, energy, calories and protein. So I generally tell people, and I, <laughs> I have come, I've, I've come to the point where I'm telling people your diet, especially if you need to gain some weight or maintain healthy weight, try and make your diet a template of like meat and potatoes <laughs> um, because it just makes sense. And you don't have to do red meat necessarily, but if you can do chicken or fish or eggs or tofu um, or legumes, get some protein and get some starch. That's the template. That's what you need first and foremost. If you're going to have vegetables, great, but cook them in olive oil, roast them, saute them, grill them, get some calories out of them. And if you're going to have fruit, that's fine. But, you know, after the fact, after you've had your, uh, your, your meal, a lot of people are still eating low fat because uh, no surprises, the government was, uh, our government was promoting that type of uh, dietary pattern. I just want to say that low fat is not actually what's recommended now. We just want heart healthy fats. And the Mediterranean diet is up to 40% fat. So I actually advocate for a higher fat diet because it will serve you and food will taste better, possibly. <laughs> uh, low carb, I mentioned this at the beginning. It is true that in the standard American diet, who, uh, that there are a lot of excessive refined unhealthy carbohydrates, that is true. However, for, for you all, carbohydrates are your friend. Um, they really help provide calories, they provide nutrients, they provide fiber, and you may not think about this, but carbs help raise your insulin levels, which help you gain weight. Insulin's an anabolic hormone, um, and you need some higher insulin levels to put on some weight. So I'm not telling you to go binge on voodoo donuts. That's not what I'm saying. Although I am okay with voodoo donuts after you've had your meal. The, the, so... I like healthy carbs. I want them in your diet on a regular basis. Um, and I'll mention the kind of blood sugar issue a little bit later on, but there is also a sweet spot for sweets. And that is they can help top off your feeding frenzy if that's what you need to do. And everyone has like extra space for that extra sweet. And if that's a way that you can get more calories then I'm gonna say that's okay, as long as you're getting your good meals. So people are not eating red meat. And to some degree, I'm okay with that. As long as you're getting other protein foods, um, you do have higher protein needs with NTM. So you do need more protein. If you're trying to be heart healthy, you can have red meat, uh, two servings up to twice a week. 
that's probably indistinguishable in terms of risk uh, compared to not having it at all. So you can have some, that's okay. No dairy is very common and um, we're pretty clear on the fact that dairy does not cause mucus production. Um, there is not a strong link for that in the literature. I've had two people, I think, in my entire practice here, not only in the NTM clinic, but pulmonary wise, who have told me that when they cut dairy out, it decreases their mucus production. And I think it's possible in their cases, maybe there is a connection. I can't speak to it. I just know that it's very uncommon for people really to cut out dairy and notice an improvement. Although some people do, and I, and I will go along with that as long as you find a good substitute. I would argue that dairy is also not inherently inflammatory and that its benefits outweigh the costs. Same with gluten, people are eating are not eating gluten and obviously if you have celiac disease, um, that's appropriate. If you do not have celiac disease and you have a, a, a gluten sensitivity, it may also be appropriate as long as you have a substitute, um, rice or potatoes or something like that. But for the general, uh, for everybody else, Gluten is not by itself inflammatory, and I would argue the benefits outweigh the costs. A lot of people are not eating sugar, and by and large, I understand why that is. Um, some added sugar is okay. Probably everyone here could, could um, meet the, the stringent WHO guidelines for added sugar, which is less than 25 grams of added sugar per day, and still enjoy some sugar. So there can be a little bit of a budget, for you to top off your regular diet as well as just enjoy a special occasion. So there's room for it and it can be enjoyed sensibly. Okay, in terms of guidelines, my overarching message here is you need more, not less. So with calories, we're looking for ways to add calories for most people. Your calorie needs are 30% higher with NTM. And what I can tell you is that means for if you need to maintain or particularly need, if you need to restore weight, your calorie needs are at least 1800 calories, more like 2000 calories. What I have seen in practice is that people, especially women or people who are underweight, they need something closer to 2100 to 2300 calories or more on a consistent basis to make any meaningful progress with weight loss. That's a lot. And you need to put effort into doing that. For men, it's a little bit higher. So this requires work, and that's why um, people, when they come here, they see dietitians. Protein, similar story. We need more, not less. So we're trying to add versus subtract. Your estimated, my, I would estimate your protein needs are 30% higher. In general, as a general rule, most people who cross my path, your needs are 60 to 90 grams of protein a day. I know that might be somewhat unintelligible, but think of two eggs as 12 to 14 grams. Think of four ounces, which is a quarter pounder, if you can have a visual for that, as uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 grams, that's four ounces, which is actually the size of my entire hand, which is actually small, I would argue. But this is what your minimum portion size is. Um, if you're gonna do nuts, we want at least an ounce, which is at least a quarter of a cup, ideally more than that. You might get six grams of protein from that. Um, if you do legumes, if you do a cup of legumes, you'll get anywhere from eight to 10 to maybe higher, like 15 if you're doing lentils. So try and build your meals with a protein anchor every time you eat your meals and your snacks. And same with carbohydrates. So add them rather than subtract them. Balance your proteins and your veggies cooked in oil with some type of starch or grain. Bread, oatmeal, rice, pasta, potatoes, and enjoy dessert sensibly. So I can't go into detail about this, although I will talk more about this at the NTMIR conference. So I'll be there if any of you choose to um, listen in. But if you have concerns with blood sugars, my number one comment is make sure you have perspective on it. Most people I meet with NTM, when they're worried about their blood sugars, it's a really mild issue. And you have to have someone who can speak to how mild or not it is. Um, if it's mild, then you can eat in a way that is not super restrictive. You can pick healthy carbs, you can limit portions, but not overly so, you still need to meet your weight goals. And you can eat carbs with mixed meals, proteins and fat and fiber foods, vegetables, so that all of that mix of food, when, when the carb is added to all those other good things, it kind of slows the absorption and blood sugar spikes after you eat. So you can definitely include carbs, if you truly have diabetes, 
That's another discussion. I'm um, very briefly, I would argue that your medications are your friend. You probably don't need the more advanced medications. You need the ones that are tried and true like metformin, and those could really help you get to a healthier place by allowing you to eat more with NTM. That's all I'll say on that, being mindful of time. In terms of fat, again, we want to add the heart healthy fats. Um, so I do advocate for fat with every meal. Um, to manage cholesterol, and I only have a certain amount of time to talk about this, but a lot of people are worried about cholesterol. And let me just say this. Sometimes it is a trade-off. Sometimes you are eating foods that will raise your cholesterol a little bit, but the gain in terms of your health and your immunity are significant and outweigh the potential slight rises you might see in your cholesterol. Having said that, you can pick uh, fats that will not raise your cholesterol. You can pick avocado, canola oil, extra virgin olive oil, fish and seafood, nuts and seeds, and others. So you can really pack your diet with foods that are high in fat and high in calories and still have a largely net neutral effect on your uh, cardiovascular health. Okay, so if we need a little extra help, then sometimes it's appropriate to look at appetite stimulants. I, when I meet someone who has profound loss of appetite, profound fatigue and not enough energy really to even eat sometimes or just engage in life and weight restoration is essential either because you're trying to recover yourself and get yourself back or maybe you need surgery, then I may recommend an appetite stimulant. And in interest of time, I won't go into huge detail, but I included this section here because a lot of times people you come to see us, we identify that you might benefit from an appetite stimulant, and then really it's appropriate for you to go home and speak with your primary care doctor about getting one of these agents on board. So I want to give you actually a potential roadmap for doing that. You could actually, not that you are the doctor, not that I am the doctor, but you could go back to your doctor and say, look, this is what um, I know that this has been used <laughs> with other people and it has been helpful. Would you, can we ta have this discussion now? So these are the agents that we see uh, we may use here, mirtazapine, and then plus or minus methylphenidate is kind of a super interesting uh, approach. And it's one that I'm gonna highlight because this is probably our most common approach to use. And it's not just with NTM, I see this with all kinds of pulmonary disease. And we've had really good luck with this. The other two I'll mention also, but mirtazapine is an antidepressant, but it, we tend to use it because it increases your appetite, it increases your weight as a result. You can have mood benefits and you can have sleep benefits. The downsides are that you might be too sleepy. <laughs> but we start at seven and a half grams at bedtime to start and we titrate that up as needed. Um, in people who have profound fatigue, methylphenidate, which you might know as Ritalin, actually can be a really nice trick up your sleeve. So as Chuck mentioned, um, there is synergy. Um, that term means that when you add Ritalin, which by itself is an appetite suppressant, when you add it to mirtazapine, it seems to have a synergistic effect, a better effect, more than, more than just the sum of its parts together. Um, so what we see is increased appetite and weight, increased mood, increased sleep, and then increased energy, which sometimes is key in just giving you the oomph to be able to eat. Um, as well as have the mental wherewithal to deal with this. So I put the dosing here. We might start it um, at two and a half milligrams twice a day in the morning so that you can sleep or at lunch. And then we might increase that. Uh, it's mentioned here how to take it. So these are notes for you to use if needed. <clears throat> Megase can be used. It's not, our, it's not my go-to, um, but it can be super effective in some people. But there is a risk for clots. There's a risk for dizziness, passing out, lower energy and strength. So this is generally not my first go-to, but having said that, I've seen this used alone very effectively. So sometimes it does work really well. It may work for you. It also can be added to mirtazapine and methylphenidate. And then dronabinol or marinol. Um, this one, I, don't, I do see people on this. It does help some people. But in general, this is not one of our go-tos because it's not covered by Medicare and Medicaid as far as I'm aware. So it's cost prohibitive and it's less effective and there are mind altering effects with it. So this is not our first choice. Okay, so lastly, if everything we've tried, aggressive oral intake, 
as well as and maybe an appetite stimulant, if that has not helped, then, um, and truly like if you are existing from bed to chair and you are really not thriving, tube feeding might be an appropriate thing to consider. So all I can say is be open-minded to it. Why? Because we've had really good results with it, um, or I have. And particularly if you need surgery, we've gotten people on tube feeds, restored their weight and gotten them to that operating table simply because we restored their weight with a tube feed. And it was the only way it was gonna happen. So sometimes it's necessary and life-saving. Um, and then lastly, in terms of dietary supplements, I would say a little is good. And I'll tell you what I generally recommend. I would say a lot is not better. So in general, I will always recommend a multivitamin, multimineral um, that's iron free. So why a multivitamin? Because you saw what your immune system is doing every day. It's showing up using all kinds of nutrients and it needs more and more every day. So a good age appropriate 50 plus say multivitamin is recommended. Um, I say iron free, although I realize that's a little bit controversial, but um, postmenopausal women and men who are older don't need a lot of extra iron. There is a little bit of a theoretical concern that maybe supplemental iron, not dietary iron, might uh, promote the growth of the mycobacteria. So we'd rather steer very clear of that. So unless you have true iron deficiency anemia, which honestly, we, I don't see a lot of with NTM. We typically see anemia of chronic infection, which does not respond to iron. But if you have demonstrated a true iron deficiency anemia, yes, iron supplementation is probably appropriate. For everyone else, I'd say don't take it or don't take more than the RDA, which is about eight milligrams per day. So some good multis will have about eight milligrams. Calcium and vitamin D, I think is appropriate because of bone health issues. Um, I generally recommend up to approximately 600 milligrams a day of calcium. I like the slow release forms. Um, we don't want to take too much calcium for a number of reasons, but 600 milligrams a day should help you meet your needs um, because you want a certain amount with diet and supplements combined, even if you have osteoporosis. With vitamin D, we generally like to know what your serum level is. So if you're lucky enough to know, we can adjust your supplemental D depending on what your level is. Um, those are the ones I routinely recommend. Sometimes I'll recommend vitamin C because there's some decent data that if you're taking 500 milligrams twice a day, it might shorten the duration of a cold if you happen to get one and are taking vitamin C at the same time. Um, zinc um, is also another one I see a lot of, and that one might help your immune system. The problem with zinc is people are on mega doses. They're on 50 milligrams or more per day. That can have negative side effects, including a copper deficiency anemia and other GI problems. So generally, no more than 40 milligrams of zinc a day. Your RDA is only 8 to 11 milligrams. So that's all you need. You'll get that in a good multi, and you may not need the redundancy otherwise. And that's it. So I did run a little bit over. So thank you. And I'll be around at the end for questions.